This is the AP Stats Chapter 8, uh, Lessons 1 and 2 outline on confidence intervals, uh, meaning how can we make estimates uh, that have a range of values that we're confident the true parameter lies within. Uh, so remember we learned about what a statistic was from the sample and that you, we used that to measure the parameter from the population. Um, we, in the last chapter, looked at knowing the parameter and basing our work off that. In reality, we're using the statistic to calculate the parameter most of the time. So we have to change some things, um, for example, the normal condition, in order, to, um, in order to do our calculations, since we don't know the actual parameter, um, which in real life is, tends to be what happens. We're trying to generate the statistic because we want to know the parameter. We want to know the true proportion of people who support a presidential candidate. And we want to use a small sample or as small as possible to get a representative idea of how that works. So what is a confidence interval? We're looking at a range of values uh, within which we are confident that the true value lies. And we use that based on our normal calculations in that 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Here's an example problem we're going to use to refer to as we first explore sample proportions. Uh, in a sample of 7,833 high school students from 2011, approximately 43% reported that they had texted while driving at least once in the last 30 days. So that's 43% from the sample. That's our statistic. Uh, we'll talk about that as being a point estimate in this uh, confidence interval chapter. We want to know the 95% confidence interval, where we can be 95% confident the true proportion lies for the true proportion of teens who had texted while driving in the previous 30 days. So the point estimator and estimate. Uh, the estimate is 43% here. And uh, that's the statistic that we generated in order to estimate it. Um, this is our best educated guess for the parameter. So that lies in the center of our confidence interval. Now it's determining how far above and below that estimate of 43% we are confident the true value lies. And that's called the margin of error. And how do we determine that with normal calculations? So that's our point estimate. And then our margin of error is going to be plus or minus. So above the point estimate and below to give us a range of values. And then the confidence level, 95% confidence, indicates uh, the percent of times uh, within which the, value, uh, the values we generated will actually capture the true proportion, the true parameter. Now one thing to know is that these are different as the point estimate uh, is like the middle of our range of values and the confidence interval would be the smallest value. So you take that point estimate and subtract the margin of error and then the highest value for your upper bound and add that margin of error uh, to represent the range of values within, within which we're confident the true value lies. So um, what the confidence level means, 95% confident means 95% of all possible samples of a given size from this population will result in an interval that captures the unknown parameter. So 95% of the time, if we, in the long run, if we kept generating confidence intervals, uh, 95 out of every 100, as we extended our number of trials to infinity, or close to it, would tend to catch the true value. So to interpret this, we'd say we are C percent, so 95 percent in this case, confident that the interval from lower bound to upper bound captures the actual value of the, and then insert the parameter we're trying to measure there. And that's just the general way we'll interpret confidence intervals. Um, so we're saying on a normal curve, the interval centered around our point estimate is an area of 0.95. Remember that corresponds to just about two standard deviations. 68 percent of values are within one standard deviation, 95 percent within two, 99.7 within 3. Now, two standard deviations was a rough estimate. The actual z-score is um, 1.96 above standard deviations above the point estimate, and 1.96 standard deviations below the point estimate would capture the 95% of the values in the curve. So we'll use a critical value of z-score of 1.96, and we're going to go over what I mean by critical value now and how that factors into the margin of error. Or a sample statistic is our point estimate. Everything to the right of the plus or minus, this whole thing, is our margin of error. For a confidence interval, we call the standard deviation of, of the statistic the standard error. That will remain the same even if we move from a 90% confidence interval to 95% to 99%. What changes in the margin of error 
is the critical value or the z-score. We're talking about the number of standard deviations above or below the mean. And if we use 95% confidence, which is our most common, we'll also use 90%, 99%, but that value would be 1.96. As I extend, as my confidence level gets bigger, that critical value represents a wider range of values under the normal curve. So for 99%, my margin of error is going to be bigger because the critical value is bigger. Um, at 99% confidence. And the standard deviation remains the same. So the wider the interval of the range of values, the more confident we are we've captured the true parameter. And that's, um, that's part of what we mean when we say 95% confident, 99% confidence. Now when we started looking at this, knowing, thinking that we knew the standard deviation of the population, in reality we don't know the parameter of the standard deviation. So we're going to look at how this changes the normal condition for proportions and then it, how it really changes things then for, uh, for sample means. Now before we calculate one, we have to check our three conditions. Our random condition is just as, as we've gone over before. Uh, remember, it tells us the center of our distribution equals the true center. If we have a simple random sample or a stratified random sample, some type of SRS taken to have a representative sample from the population. Then we know the mean of the sampling distribution of p hat of our sample proportion equals the true proportion. And for sample means, we know the mean of the sample the sampling distribution of sample means equals the true mean. Um, also keep in mind what we found that that lets us make an inference of the population. Uh, cause and effect is determined if we have random assignment, if it, we're talking about an experiment. The normal condition is different. So we're going to have to sub in p hat for p and the np is greater than or equal to 10 and n times the complement of p is greater than or equal to 10 in order to check that condition. Recall that our independent condition is that one observation shouldn't affect another. Numerically one occurring does not change the probability of another. That's independence. And that we haven't sampled more than 10% of the population, the 10% condition. Then we can use our formulas for standard deviation. Now here's how that breaks down uh, for a sample proportion. We have a random tells us the center, the mean of the sampling distribution of p hat is p. So we have an unbiased estimator. It's the sampling distribution is centered around the true proportion. Um, now the difference is here we have to check p hat because we don't know the true parameter. So we're looking for n times p hat being greater than, greater than or equal to 10 and n times the quantity 1 minus p hat being greater than or equal to 10. Um, here's the independent condition, and this is the standard deviation formula that we're allowed to use so long as this is met. So the big change here, the normal condition. The other two conditions are just the same, although the formula for standard deviation, while the condition is the same, the formula for standard deviation uses p hat because we don't know p, the true parameter. So that's what we substitute in for confidence interval. All in all, we have a point estimate plus or minus our margin of error. And we write that as, I'd like you to write it in this form with the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. And then also be able to, and then also write it as parentheses lower bound, upper bound, where the lower bound is the point estimate minus the margin of error and the upper bound is the point estimate plus the margin of error. So uh, recall that if the normal condition is met, this is what we're talking about. The mean here would now represent p hat or our statistic. It could be our sample mean. In this case, this is represented in terms of mean but our confidence interval would be centered here. And if we're 95% confident, we're not extending it out to just one standard deviation, but two standard deviations above and below the mean. Now two is an estimate. The actual value is 1.96. So we're saying 95% confident. We're covering everything except for the upper part of the tail and the lower part of the tail. And the sum of those two areas represents the 5% of the time um, where our confidence interval would not capture the true parameter. By just due to chance variation, sometimes our sample proportion, our sample statistic is going to be off. So this, these are really what we're talking about when we're talking about our confidence levels. And when we're talking about 68, 95, 99.7, just another reminder of how it breaks down. Now when we're looking at sample proportions, instead of mu, we're looking at p hat, because we're estimating the true sample proportion. This leads us to our one sample z interval for population proportion. Uh, it's a z interval because we're going to use a z test statistic and p hat represents our point estimate so p hat the point estimate plus or minus the critical value which is the z the value of z for the confidence levels this changes 
depending on 90, 95%, 99% confidence, times the standard deviation of the, the test statistic, which we call the standard error when it's used in order to create a margin of error. So this whole thing over to the right of the plus or minus, this whole thing is the margin of error when combined. And remember, n is our sample size. So you're going to be using this right now uh, to to answer a question that's similar to the example we started with. So let's take a look at the process and then take a look at the example problem. So you're always going to state the parameter p that you want to estimate and the confidence level, any other relevant information about the variable, uh, identifying the appropriate inference method, one sample is the interval is what we're talking about here, check those three conditions. Um, if they're met, perform our calculations showing a z-score, uh, showing your point estimate, showing the standard deviation calculated, and they conclude interpret your interval in the context of the problem, which is how we talked about interpreting the confidence level there. Uh, remember that this is our margin of error. So in problems where we're looking at a margin of error, and like let's say we want to have a margin of error of no more than 1%, we would set this equal to 0.01, and then solve uh, for 95%, put in 1.96, and then solve for the sample size we would need for a certain margin of error. Okay, so let's take a look at our example problem from the beginning. And we had our sample of 7,833 high school students, 43% that had texted while driving at least once in the last 30 days, 95% confidence, and now we know we want to use this whole setup to generate a confidence interval. Here again, I am plugging in p hat, 0.43, z critical value for 95% confidence will be 1.96, and then my standard error formula. 7,833 was the sample size, and I'm using p hat here instead of p. When we simplify this, we get our standard error here. We multiply 1.96 by this, and now this is our margin of error, 0 0.01096. If I add that to my point estimate of 0.43, I get 0.441, my upper bound. If I subtract that from 0.43, I get 0.419, my lower bound. And I can conclude by saying we are 95% confident that the true proportion of teens who texted while driving at least once in the past month is between 41.9% and 44.1%. Uh, now keep in mind uh, where all of that came from. Uh, this is conditions being met, having the random condition met that this was a random sample. We use n times p hat. The sample size times 0.43 is greater than or equal to 10. The sample size times its complement is greater than or equal to 10. We have to assume that there are at least 78,330 teen drivers, uh, which seems fair, but if in real life we're doing this, I would check that out. Um, if we're not given that information, we just say that we assume there are at least 10 times that. So go over that, and your free response is going to be quite similar. So suppo suppose we took an SRS of 1,000 Americans who are registered voters here in San Francisco. And we want to measure the proportion who support Bernie Sanders for president because we want to know the true support for Bernie Sanders in San Francisco. We find that 550 out of 1,000 polled support Bernie Sanders for president. I want you to check the random, normal, and independent conditions. Calculate the 95% confidence interval showing the point estimate plus or minus critical value, the z value times the standard error, and then show what the margin of error was and the lower and upper bound were. So pause right now and answer that, and then push play for your multiple choice. We do not know our true parameter p, and we use p hat instead. What does that change? The random, normal, independent condition? Does it change the formula for standard deviation? Um, pause here. Take a look back at the video, at the outline in Schoology. Look over the summary in your book, and then answer your multiple choice as well.